Hi there, everybody. It's really good to see you all again. Um, today is our, we're going to really kind of roll up our sleeves and, and deal with some brass tacks and, 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 and details about making this work with your classroom, making this work with your family. Um, the, the previous one was a little bit more kind of in theory, you know, do the activity, right? Um, and that can only get you so, oh, actually, I'm going to just distract myself for a minute. Isn't this cool? Look at the light coming through the window. See this orange color? That's smoke in the air. We've got fires and you can actually see this is kind of sort of sign of the times. Number one sign of the times, we're on Zoom, right? Second sign of the times, you're looking at a video of somebody who's in filtered smoky light. Um, kind of interesting. So there we can, we can nature journal about that, right? So, but, but today what I want to do is I want to, to, to really get into strategy and details and mechanics of making things work because um, I have, I've spent a lot of time doing nature journaling with kids in lots of different settings and I've made a bunch of the mistakes already. So you don't have to. So we can, we can talk about that and I'll share some of those strategies. So things that I want to, to address today of, you know, like what, like how would you really kind of go about setting up your students to be successful doing this? Like what do you need to do to kind of equip people? Then when you're going to go out and do these activities, what does that setup look like? And, and when I say doing an activity, um, let's be a little bit more specific about that. And we'll, we'll actually walk through a few examples. Um, and those are, those are examples that are detailed in this book. So um, this book or the free download of this book, which you can get if you go into the chat below, you'll be able to, to find a little box there that you can click. Um, uh, somebody's going to put in a, a link on how to get this book um, at no cost. Um, um, or, or if you want to order one of them, you can. So I'm, I'm going to be referencing that. Um, but just know that that is there as, as so there's the paper version um, of these, these notes. And step by step, the, there are lesson plans that are spelled out in there. But we're going to go through a few of those and just kind of unpack them as an example. Because what, what I found is that if I go to a workshop on, uh, let's say, a Project, Project Wild workshop, and they give you this big book of Project Wild activities, right? but in the workshop, they demonstrate three of them. I come home and I do those three activities because I can visualize it. Right? So we're actually going to walk through some of them. We're not going to go through the entire book, but to help you visualize all the activities in this entire book, um, Emily Ligren, the co-author, and I are making a website that has um, print, where you can print out the um, activity by activity, those activities, and we're also making videos of an instructor giving all the instructions so you can actually see somebody doing it, and you're like, like oh, I guess I, I understand how that can happen. Um, other things on our agenda today, um, we're going to take a look at a little bit of science standards. And I know that there are some people on this call who are, um, who are classroom teachers. And some of those classroom teachers are in next generation science standards states, and some of them aren't. But there's also actually a majority of folks on this call are homeschool families. And you're thinking, science standards, not really my bag, right? I'm, I'm not, why should I want to know about this? This is actually, this is actually going to be really, really useful. And you kind of get through this and be like, oh, that's really cool. I think I can incorporate that into my homeschool game. And um, so this is a, a little bit of standard stuff that makes sense and is really practical and useful and, it's, and it really is based on, on best practices in, in, in science. And so I'll be sharing a little bit of that with you. Um, we're also going to look at, I know that uh, there are some people who are going to be doing this live in person, and others are going to be doing it through this Zoom platform. And so we're going to also take a look at how you would go about doing that in, in a Zoom environment. So to get started, let's think about gearing up our, our students. Anything that you do, um, the work between you and getting out the door 
the inertia from that is negative reinforcement to doing that activity. If it is really, really difficult to get the family out the door to go to a picnic, you end up not really going on picnics. But if you make the logistics of just setting up the picnic, then you go on more picnics, right? It's the same with nature journaling. If you set up your, your students so that everybody kind of has their kit, they know what to do, and you've got some routines around nature journaling, and it's not a hassle to kind of look all over the place. Um, it's so much easier to get out and, and do your nature journaling. So the tools for doing it are really, really, uh, really, really simple. All right? Your classic Dixon Ticonderoga number two pencil is an amazing nature journaling tool. Right? And you do not need to get any more you know, fancy or over the top than that. Um, so you need, you need just some pencils, um, some little handheld pencil sharpeners because these will get broken in the field. Some students will lose their pencil. So you're gonna have some extras, but you're gonna get yourself some pencils and you are almost all the way there because what do you need now? You need some journals. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, journals and kind of what makes sense to, um, to, to, to set yourself up for a journal. Um, there are some really nice low cost ways to do it. And a lot of them are already, um, you're already familiar with those. So, uh -huh. All right. composition books make great nature journals. Um, and there's, there's several different types. Um, what you, the most important thing to look for um, is number one, there are some um, composition books that have really floppy covers now. It's this very almost plasticky thing and, and it's, it's not at all stiff. There are others, the old school ones, have a really stiff, stiff pieces of cardboard flanking either side. Those are the ones you want to look for. Um, and so, um, un unfortunately, you know, things like some of the, 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 the basic brand now out of Office Depot is it's floppy cover. So you do want to look around and see if you can get yourself, you know, where can you find stiff cardboard um, uh, journals? Because when you're out there in the field, if you have something that has rigidity to it, you can sit down anywhere and start journaling and working. But if you have to, if you need a clipboard when you're out there, it's just, it's one more, more thing. You can't just be writing on your lap, on your knee, wherever it is. You need a table. Those, those, those floppy ones work great if you have a table, but you're not going to have a table. Um, the, uh, there's um, a, a few kind of uh, different brands of these. Some composition books you can find that are quad ruled. Those are really cool because everybody loves graph paper. Um, so if you can find those, that's fun, but it's not necessary. Um, some, um, not the majority of them, but I found some where the ink lines are really, really heavy to the point that they're distracting. So just not those, but just so you find yourself, you know, it's a standard, you know how they look. That works great. And you're, you're good to go. Um, Another way to go is with books that are all uh, blank journals. And if, you're, if your students, um, so if, if you can get something that has, 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 has blank paper in it, uh, and you can buy lots of sketchbooks in art supply stores that, that look like this. This is neat because it's very open-ended. How are you going to use this page? There's no, you don't look at the page and there's nothing suggesting to you like you should write lines. Right? It's completely open-ended. And um, as you're giving students more and more tools of what to do with it, this open-ended journal sphere is really useful. Um, Yes, they will, if they're writing paragraphs, they'll start to slant those paragraphs and those sorts of things, but it's gonna be okay. So if you can find um, ones that are, are, are blank books, this is great. For a large classroom, that sometimes gets expensive. For a small family group, you can get yourself 
um, sketchbooks at a, at a reasonable price at any art supply store in your community. If you do want journals that have, um, uh, if you do want journals that are blank and hardbound and low cost, um, there's a, 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 a brand called Bear Books. This is a Bear Book. And um, Bear Books have, there's a, a, a hard binding. And then there is, there's blank white paper on the inside. And that is, and, there, and, it's, and it's reasonable weight paper too. So um, they're, 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 they're quality little books and they're just a, a few dollars a piece. Um, so bear as in, um, well, somebody, uh, one of the, the admins behind the scenes um, will, will, um, will, will put in some of the, the, the details. There's a question, some people are wondering like, will that work with watercolor? And the answer is yes. Right? So, um, they're, 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 they're nifty little journals. You know, regular thin paper does tend to bow a little bit when you're, you're putting watercolor on it. I don't actually suggest watercolor for beginning journalers um, because with watercolor, there's a, there is a big learning curve. And when you do get into watercolor, using things like brush pens that have the water in the handles makes the logistics of that a lot better. But sometimes managing these on a whole class um, for, for a large class of students gets difficult. Um, if you have a small homeschool team that you're working with, then at some point, if you want to kind of bust into watercolors, it's great to do. I find that the easiest way to start though is just with your Dixon Ticonderoga number two pencil. And at the beginning, that's, that's all you're using. And then at some point when you think they're ready, <clears throat> you bust out a small set of colored pencils. So not the jumbo set and not crayons, but a small set of colored pencils. And, and it's just like, oh, all of a sudden they know exactly, they know just what to do with that. And it is so much fun. Um, they, they, you'll, you'll, you'll go from um, you know, journal pages that look like this, right, to journal pages the next day, they're doing that. And oh, they're having so much fun. But with any tool, just be aware that, that when you first introduce a new tool to students, it, that tool becomes a distraction. So if you pass out, say, magnifying glasses to people, when you first get magnifying glasses, the magnifying glass is a distraction. Right? They're, they're trying to burn things with it and they're just like you know, looking at their hand and things. And then, but then later on, after using that for a day or two, the, it, the distraction's gone and it becomes a useful tool. The same thing will, ha be, will happen when you introduce, you know, even a ruler. When you first get a ruler, you're like, it's a sword. And then it becomes a thing for measuring. Um, but the, uh, even the, the set of colored pencils, when you first, first pull that out, it will be just so distracting because like they've got like all these, but that, that's okay. And just sort of know that that happens and it gets better. Um, so my, my two big suggestions, uh, or, or my, my, my big suggestions are, you want to get a, a journal with a hard cover. You also want to get something that does not have a spiral binding, right? So spiral bindings, are not going to hold up to the kind of abuse that you're going to be giving this book over the course of the year. And by the end of a school year, um, or the, um, a, you know, if, if some kids will, will go through it even more quickly than that, um, the, the book will just be in tatters and falling about, pages will be falling off, the spiral will be, will be getting bent. And then aesthetically, it's yucky to pick up and use. You'll get these, these ones where like the spiral, the, the spring is partly pulled out. The kid doesn't like that. It's aesthetically no fun. And if, um, and so they get less invested in their journal. But if, if you get something that's a hardbound book, it feels more like a, like a real thing. It's a place, like you can go to the, the journal. It's like a real book, 
and you're writing in your own book. And that's cool. It's really nice to have a hardbound book. So I like hardbound. I like sewn in bindings, not a spiral bound. Um, if you can get blank pages, that's great. If not, you're going to be fine just with a standard composition book, and then you're off to the races. It's good to have a, um, a Ziploc bag in the student's desk that has their journal in it and their pencil in it, and eventually it'll have their set of colored pencils in it. Um, you can also have in that bag um, a little pencil sharpener so that when it's time to go nature journaling, you say, all right, everybody grab your kit. Everybody grabs your kit. The more advanced version of that is that if you're doing this, say, with your, your family, um, if each kid has a bag, a sack, that has their adventure gear in it, then you just say, all right, grab your adventure kit, and we're heading out the door. So then they're going to grab it. You know it's going to have their pencil in it, their journal in it, whatever other tools, the magnifier, the ruler, the the things that you've supplied them for that adventure um, kit. There's uh, some teachers I know actually have a pegboard by the side of by the by the front of their classroom that has um, has has nature journaling shoulder bags for each kid hanging on, hanging on them, and um, those the, you know those little drawstring backpacks, you know, those work great for making little nature journal kits. You can get those often for free if you get them with a company logo on the back. You know, so if you don't mind it saying Pfizer or something like that on the back of every one of your students, um, you can get those little drawstring backpacks um, for, for free. All right. um, so you've got your kit, you're good to go. And then you head out the door. And what you're going to be doing is over at the start, you're going to be giving structured activities to the students. And um, they're going to be building nature journaling skills as you do this. Eventually, you'll be able to just grab your bags, head out in the woods, and everybody knows what to do. And if somebody finds something, they bust out their kit, and they're just working automatically on their own. Um, what we're finding is that this nature journaling can have such an intrinsic pull to it. The kids want to do it on their own. But at the start, there's a lot of scaffolding. We're going to be going into that today. What does that scaffolding look like to set you up for success? So let's imagine that you have a, um, you, you have uh, your, your state um, or district allows partial classrooms to meet again. And you're going to go out in the field with a group of students, or you are a, either a, a large family, or you are part of a homeschool co-op, and it's you and, and a few other families that are within your pod. So you've got about 15 kids with you. Um, at the start when you're doing this, um, smaller numbers work great. Um, when you bring a larger group of students out on, and you've seen this on a field trip, when you bring a larger group of students outside, the level of chaos goes up. The first few times you bring those students outdoors, it's going to be pretty zooey. Because they're going like, oh, we get to go outside, field trip, yes, we're going outside, right? And, and going outside <clears throat> for all the rest of their academic career has meant it's playtime, it's recess. And so they're going outside with you. They're thinking, okay, this is a little recess time. But pretty soon they're going to get the idea that, oh, we're actually doing some structured activities when we, we do this. And that level of chaos will go down. Can you do this with a class of 30 or 35 people? Yes, absolutely. And I do it on um, a, a regular basis. But it does just be aware that when you go, go out, you want to kind of set clear expectations. This is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be going out. We're going to be doing some nature journaling activities. And so uh, this is what you, so, so they know what to expect. And then when you get out there, the big test is, did you mean what you said? So back in the classroom, set the expectation. We're going to be going outside. These are, um, you're going to be, you know, staying with me. I'm going to be giving you these instructions on what to do. 
And then we're going to have 15 minutes where you're going to be working independently in your own journal. Then we're going to be getting back. So you give them whatever instru instructions you want to give in the classroom. Then when you get out there into the field, there, the, um, if you didn't set any of those expectations, they're in every direction, right? But even if you did, the second test that you have to pass when you're bringing the, the students out there is those things that you said inside, did you mean it? And so you just have to be ready. It's not that they're being bad kids or anything. They just, they need, it's their job to test that. And so they're going to try to push the, let's go out and be zooey. And um, you're going to sort of remind them like, no, remember, this is, this is our time for classroom. So sometimes if people are too distracted standing up, we'll have them sit down. Um, the, uh, but sort of be, be, just sort of be prepared that when, once you are outside, there's sort of a second um, uh, a time when you have to kind of make it clear that actually this is, this is our class and we're doing it outdoors. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to choose one activity, one simple phenomenon, and, and a, one set of skills that they're going to be, be messing with. And you're going to present that to them in kind of a, a structured and controlled way. In this, in this, this book, we have a bunch of activities and I'm just going to put some of these activities under the document camera so that you can see that there's, there, these are, are very kind of structured for you. If you want like step one, step two, step three, and a script, that's in here. Um, I don't, what most people find is that they kind of will originally kind of read over the script, kind of figure out what you're saying and what you're doing. But then when you... Um, are, are out in the field, um, you're going to be diverting, diverging from that script because you're not going to be reading it off um, out there. Let me just sort of show you the degree of structure that is in this book here. All right. So here is, here is an activity. Oh, let's zoom back out. the document camera up. All right, so this is one activity. It gives you the time, the materials that you need, and kind of a little, a little kind of summary of what is going to be, be happening. And then there on each page, there is a little example of what a whiteboard demonstration would look like. And I will be kind of showing you kind of how that looks on a real whiteboard here. But we find drawing out as you're giving instructions, um, giving people an explanation of what you're going to be doing and how that could look on the page just on a little portable whiteboard, really, really helpful. And then we have the procedure step by step. If you want to, you can just read the big bold titles. And then the ABCs are like how a person could verbally give those instructions. So if you were just to read something out, you could read that out. But probably the easiest thing to do, especially for an experienced teacher, is just read over that. Okay, I see where you're going. And then you can do that with the students. Um, Jack, can I interrupt just for a moment? The, yes. um, the, the view is a little bit blurry. So um, we're mm. not really able to read the, the words, but I think we can follow you along as you're, you're talking it through. Do you have the PDF on your computer that you might be able to share? Um, I do, but it, uh, for me to find that would yeah. be, would it take okay. a layer, a level to, of organization the book. Uh, that I am not, uh, that, I, that I can't do. Um, so then um, in this, the, this book, there is on each one, there is a discussion. So after you do the activity, you have a discussion and that's where the students are gonna make a lot of their meaning. There's just generally a general discussion. These are questions that you could ask with the whole group. And then if you, you can also, you'll see that in, out in the discussions section, there are some of the next generation science standards cross-cutting concepts listed. You know, here's patterns, here's structure and function. Um, you could have a, an additional discussion around one of those cross-cutting concepts. I don't remember, suggest doing more than one, but you can, 
just sort of tie this into some of the bigger ideas that are kind of going on um, in, your, in your class. And so some guiding questions for how you might do that are written um, out there for you. So that same, um, that, that same approach is then followed for activity after activity after activity. And there are 31 of those in this book. And these are all things that have been kid tested, teacher tested, and they tie into the next generation science standards. Um, but let's just take a look at, at how this, this, this could look. So I'm going to imagine that you are, 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 are one of the teachers, right? Or, or my group of students, you're my, my students. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you just a little bit of kind of quick, quick clear um, uh, directions and, and I'm gonna show you how I might diagram that with a simple diagram on the whiteboard. When I'm diagramming on the whiteboard, this is not a place for fancy art. That's why I use the big broad tip Expo marker. If you have the fine one, you might start trying to draw a careful picture. And that's, this isn't the place for that. This is just, you're going to suggest some visual layout. All right. So imagine that we have gone out into the school um, ball field. And there is a, hold on a second. All right. So you, there you are, you're on the school field. And um, there are, around the edges of it, there's that zone that doesn't get mowed by the district gardeners. So there's a bunch of weeds that are sticking up there, some dandelions and those sorts of things. And you walk out there and there, you realize that there's, there's a few different kinds of kind of dandelion-ish weeds out here. Okay, that's going to be your phenomenon. So that little bit of nature of all the things that you could focus on, that's going to be your target. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk over here with me. And all right, can you see? I want everybody to get around here. Um, and whatever sort of, uh, you know, bump, 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 bumps or stand in the circle, whatever you do for corralling your students, you do that, you get everybody there looking at whatever it is that is in front of you. And what you say is, all right, there are some interesting details of the, the plants that are growing out here that most people will never see. A lot of people have walked past this and may have noticed that there are yellow flowers here, but there's actually some really weird um, structures and shapes that are, are happening in these. And there's more than one kind out here. And a lot of people would just look at this and you see yellow flowers and you, all right, and, and you, you think that this is, there's, 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 there's dandelions out here. Well, what we're going to do is just notice, um, I'm going to just show you one difference on, on two different plants. And then the rest of it is going to be up for you. Everybody come on over here and look at this one here. You see if I um, look at the, the stems of this, these are kind of, they're tall, thin, um, hairy stems. And there are these little branches off of them. So that's, look at the branches on this. So big yellow flower, right? Now compare that with this one over here. How is that one different? Right, that's right. It's, it's got that smooth stem and there's no branches on it, right? So that's just one. So these are our two plants. Right? My challenge for you is to, on your journal page, to identify and describe as many differences as you can between these two. You got this one over here and this one over here. And let me just show you a little bit of the format of how we're going to be doing that. Take a look at my whiteboard. I'm going to make a T chart. We've done this before for other projects in our class. But this is a really useful way of organizing information. And what I'm going to do on this t-chart is make a comparison between these two. So 
tell me um, one thing you notice. Take a look at these two and somebody just tell me one observation that you may notice about them. And perhaps a student notices that um, on one of them the flowers are big and the other are small. All right, so that's, okay, that's a great way to start. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to draw a circle on each one of these showing the approximate size of those flowers. So if I put my journal down next to this, notice how that flower is about that size and that one's about that size. All right, and if I want to, I can you know, add a little bit more information in all those little rays coming out. But the most important thing here is that size. And so I'm gonna write big flowers and small flowers next to those. All right. What's another difference that I can see between these two? And somebody else points out another thing. And so I will, you know, maybe somebody points out how these are branching and these are just straight tubes, All right? Um, and then I'm gonna write in sort of V-shaped branches and no branches, All right? So even for the words, I'm just making, I'm, I'm just kind of making these little kind of squiggles. And I've only, there's only been one time that student, I had a student think that they were supposed to write, draw squiggly lines on their paper instead of, of words. So generally just sort of let them know that this is, this is sort of representing that you're, you're kind of writing words and text in there. So I want to have pictures and words here together. What's another difference I see? So, and so once they kind of get this big idea and they get this idea of parallel structure, then they can just go to town with it. And um, they know what to do. They've got the T-chart made. This structure on the page makes for a very kind of clear organization of things. And it's clear that the, it were, our purpose here is not to make a pretty picture, but I want to find as many differences as I can between these two things. And um, then you ask if there are any, any questions and there aren't any. You say, all right, my challenge for you is to find as many differences as you can. Um, and on your mark, we're going to have 15 uh, minutes or 13 minutes, you know, on your mark, get set, go. And so they start doing this. As an adult, you're then, you initially, are demonst you pull out your journal and you start doing the same thing. But as you're doing that, you're looking out of the corner of your eye and, and you're looking for the students who are kind of, like, they don't know what to do. And you can just kind of go over to that person and kind of just re kind of direct them and say like, right, do you have any questions about what's going on here? And very often they'll say like, like I don't know what to do, all right? And then I just say, all right, that's, that's all right. Um, so let me just kind of, you know, help you. Like what, what's something you notice about this? What's something you notice about this? Okay, and they'll say something. Okay, good. Now, um, how's that different on this one? Right, and they'll, they'll tell you. Like, okay, now what, what's another thing? And they'll, they'll say another thing. And sometimes when you're just asking them those questions, they'll come up with those differences. And you say, that's great. Now let's put that down on paper. And they go like, oh, okay. And then they sit down and they start doing it. So you just kind of can gently direct them into doing this activity. And now what they're doing is actually a really sophisticated thing. When you are comparing things, you will notice details about the individual things that there's no way you would have seen if you're just looking at one on their own. It turns out that doing a joint comparison between two things helps you focus on the characteristics of each one of those to a greater degree than you would by, a, by just an analysis of one thing by itself. You can think about this um, if your school has a 401k plan. Right. Sometimes they say like oh, we've got, you know, like welcome new teacher. You know, part of your check is going to go into this, 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 this 401k plan, and that can be invested in plan A or plan B. And when you're looking at those two plans side by side, you can go like, oh, I think I like this one better. But if you're just looking at one, you go like, I have no idea whether this is a good plan or not. But the minute there's two things side by side, the characteristics of one and the strengths and weaknesses of that help you sort of see characteristics of the other. So if you're just drawing a plant by itself, it has green leaves. The minute you're doing two different species, then students will start to know like, oh, wow, this is, this is a light green one that's a dark green one. All of a sudden green has all these different nuances to it. So what you're doing at this point as, as a teacher is 
you're trying to number one, just be a role model. And they see you also journaling. This ends up being really important. Um, if a teacher during free reading time is grading spelling tests, it sends a, a subtle message about the value of reading to all the students in the room. If, they, if the teacher has to actually set a little clock because they know they're just going to get lost in a good book, right, then you're role modeling that like, yeah, we read. We read in this class. We read in this family. We're readers. So they, they may not listen to anything you say, but they watch everything they do. If they see you getting lost in your journaling, they go like, oh, this actually, this must be something that is significant and worth doing. So they're watching you do that. But then you also are going to have to have that teacher radar out, that spidey sense, where you're kind of looking at like, okay, all right, that student over there, they're, they're kind of losing their focus, and um, they're going to need a little bit of redirection. And so you can come, come over to that, that student, kind of help them, redirect them, and then you try to go back to doing your thing. Right? So you're going to have to juggle those. Both are important. Sometimes at the start, you have to spend a little bit more time working, kind of redirecting students. And at a certain point, you're going to sort of see like the kids are kind of starting to kind of go like, okay, I'm done, 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 I'm done. So the amount of time that you spend doing an activity is totally flexible. If you look around and your students are just all deeply into it, let the clock run. Because they're doing the most important thing. But if you're seeing that they're like, they're really getting antsy, right? Then that, you know, 12 minute activity may end up being a nine minute activity, right? Or that 12 minute activity may be, end up going for a half an hour because the kids get lost in it. And um, when that happens, it's just, it's absolutely magic. So you've given them very clear structure, they're doing their activity, and then at some point, you're gonna decide, all right, it's time to wrap this up. But here's the problem. Some of your students are still deep into it. Others are like, yeah, I'm pretty much done here, right? So what I like to do is say, all right, raise your hand if you would like a few more minutes to, um, to, to finish working on what you're doing. Just as a show of hands, so raise your hand, and then you'll see, you can kind of check there's, there's some hands going up. All right, you say like, all right, let's give this a, a, a few more minutes. And that says to the rest of the kids who are kind of getting antsy, this is coming to a close, and just be patient, this is gonna stop. Right? And it also helps those kids who are still, who are really kind of getting their groove on in something, be able to prepare themselves for the next transition. And that's going into your discussion. So then, when you're ready, gather everybody together. In some cases, what I will do is I will tell the students that if you are done, come join me here under this tree. If you are still working on something and need a little bit more time, it's okay with me if you take that and just you decide when you're ready and done, come on back here and join us right here under the tree. They love that little bit of autonomy. Um, you're kind of, and it's also kind of respecting, noticing like you're doing some really important stuff out there. And, and, and I respect that. Um, and then you bring everybody in. And if you remember from our previous class, we talked about the importance of then having that discussion. And so I would sit the students down and what, what I tend to find is the most successful is that I will, instead of, instead of leading with asking a question and, you know, raise your hands. I really, really like the think, pair, share um, approach where you get a students, you, you ask them a question and I would like you to just take a moment and think about that. And when you, if you come up with an idea, write that down on your piece of paper. So they're writing a little idea down, All right? And then turn and discuss it with a partner. So once they've written it down, they turn and they, they have a discussion with their partner about whatever question that is. They see if the partner came up with the same one, can they come up with a third um, I, I, uh, answer to the question or whatever it is. And then you turn and 
and ask the same question to the whole group. Because they've had a little bit more time to think about it, the sorts of answers that you're going to get are more interesting, more sophisticated, they make for a better discussion. And um, so this has, has, has lots of, 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 of different names. It can be yeah, the, the turn and talk um, or the, the, the think, pair, share. Um, any of those are, are good, but you'll find also for kids who are language learners, or kids who um, are often don't participate in discussions, when they have an opportunity to do that, they're much more likely to participate. And, and that's, that's for, for me, that's, that's really, really satisfying. If I can do something where it gets those kids that are normally, because you're going to be asking them about questions about things that they directly observed they have something to share in this conversation because they had equal access to those dandelions out there and they noticed things while they were doing it they've now had some time to think about that they can participate in this discussion so with this activity i might um, ask you know all right so what were um in what ways wh what were the most significant ways that you found that these were these two things were different how many differences could you find or you could ask, in what ways were they similar? Um, and why do? You, what might be some 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 reasons why they share those features? So those are are just questions that you could you can ask the the whole group. And if you would like to, then um, you can turn the conversation to one of your favorite cross cutting concepts. So what I will, what I tend to do is in a discussion, is I will pick one cross-cutting concept, and we'll kind of for people who are not familiar with this, we'll, we'll be kind of I'll be showing sharing some of the, what those are with you in a moment. They're a list of kind of big picture science ideas, things like structure and function. So let's say you chose structure and function, all right? And so you might start just asking questions about, all right, so um, were there any structures on these things that um, had a generally a similar shape, right? What was that shape, right? In what ways were they different? Um, why do you, you know, how might being different like that, can anybody come up with a possible explanation for how that could help something survive, right? And, and give it a, a different survival advantage. Sometimes plants have a feature that helps do one thing or helps do another thing. Can you come up with a possibility, a possible guess? So I'm not asking them to be right. I'm asking them just to kind of, guess about could there be any structure and function connections between these and you just bounce around a conversation about that and my my um general approach when i'm leading a question in a session like this is i'll drop the question on them they've already had a chance to think about it they shared it with somebody and then there are going to be more hands coming up and I'll, and then my what i'm saying is like oh that's interesting tell me more about that Another big question that I ask is like, oh, if they kind of say, well, it's this because of this. I'll often ask them like, oh, that's interesting. What's, um, what makes you think that? Or, or was there any evidence that supported that? What makes you, what makes you think that? What's, so they're, they're sort of thinking about, I, I feel they're making a statement. I will often ask them to see if they can back that up with, with, with any evidence. And that makes for some really interesting conversations. And again, this is the sort of stuff that everybody who's done that activity can participate in. One of the final things I'll also do is I will get them to think at a meta level about the, what they have been doing, um, both conceptually and with journaling strategies. So there's a lot of research on metacognition. So metacognition, again, is this idea that if we think about how we are thinking about things, we think better, right? So if you can sort of analyze the way that you are exploring a problem and thinking about it, you're, you, you end up doing higher levels of thinking. But here's the problem with metacognition. If I were to ask you, to think about what you are thinking about right now, you would not be able to do it. You cannot think about what you're thinking about right now because the minute you start thinking 
about what you're thinking about right now, you are not thinking about that thing. You're thinking about thinking about that thing. So you're not actually seeing yourself doing this activity. You're seeing yourself thinking about this activity. But if you've been journaling and you're getting all your ideas and you're putting them down on paper, your brain has been transferred down to this piece of paper. And you can now do metacognition about what you've been thinking about. And so one way of doing this is I'll have students look down at their, their paper and I will say, all right, are there any, um, what are the, the, the big ideas of, of, what, of what, what's happening here, right? Or, or sometimes like if we have been having the structure function conversation, I have people like writing down some notes and ideas. All right, so what are some of the big, like what is the, the big subject, the, the header of what we've been discussing here, of what you've been exploring on your journal page? And somebody will um, come up with, a, they'll say, well, it's, it's looking at um, differences in, in, in plant structures. Okay, um, and the and in that, were there any kind of is there a subcategory? Are there um, the or there little subjects in that? Yeah, we're looking at the leaves, and we're also kind of wondering about flowers and what the flowers do. All right, so they've just come up with the title for the page and some subtitles on the page. And you just give them some time to kind of write with bubble letters and things like that, write the title of kind of the big picture idea of what we're doing here on the page. They also get to, you know, they can um, put in some subtitles and circle the parts that are related to that. And it makes the page look really cool. There are these titles and kids love writing in bubble letters or block letters. There are things that are related. You can draw lines between them. And so all of a sudden, kids are kind of thinking about this page and organizing it. After they've got stuff down, out of the head, they put it on paper. They're now just giving you a few titles and subtitles and circling related things, putting stars next to the things that they think are particularly cool or an exclamation point. See, at this point, I'm going to turn on the light over there because it's starting to turn dark here. Hey, look at this. There we go. Now it's a little bit too bright, but here we are. Um, so I'll just sort of show you a few kind of fun things that you can um, do in this sort of metacognitive part of the, the journal. This is, and um, let me see here. I want, no, I don't want that button. I want, I want this button. So, um, yeah, here are some really fun things you can do. Let's say um, there is an observation that you've made that is really, really interesting to you. All right. Um, what we can, we found is you can draw little eyeballs looking at it, All right? So little kind of observation eyeballs looking at whatever is there. Um, another fun thing to do is you can draw, if there's a cool um, observation, you can make an exclamation point next to it. Um, you can put stars, right? You know, this is like a three star observation. This is, this is a big, big deal. So you can put little icons in to highlight the coolest things you've learned. Similarly, if you came up with any good questions, you can make a big question mark next to those. All right. You can put boxes around things that are related to each other. If this relates to the other thing that's over here, you can draw a little arrow in to show that these things are related. You can put in a title And when you're putting in a title, again, you're thinking about the big picture idea of, of what is happening on this journal page. That is metacognition. 
you're thinking about all those different pieces. And why is this so important? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, let me pull up um, just a, a, an interesting diagram for you. We saw this the other day. Right? Remember on the when we were uh, starting out our our, our, our first nature journal workshop, we, I showed you, nope, I don't want that. I want, remember this depressing observation? All right, so if, if you, you remember this, this is, this is the forgetting curve, the notorious forgetting curve. And this is based on uh, lots of research that's been replicated a bunch of times. Um, and it is utterly um, humbling for us as teachers. That is that we, we teach our students something and within the first 18 to 20 minutes, they have lost about half of that information. And by the end of the day, more than that. And by the end of a, a, a week, you're down to um, less than 40% of whatever that wonderful lecture was. Doesn't matter how engaging it was. It's just that our brains are really good at forgetting stuff. Um, so that is, that's a bummer, right? But um, Ebbinghaus um, was also interested in how do we remember stuff? And so his follow-up activity was on this is what happens if you go back and you start to kind of review and think about things that you were studying what happens to your memory then and check this out this is is within the first 18 minutes if you do if you kind of go and review your notes and the things that you've been studying your memory goes back up. And now it begins degrading again, but this time it will be, uh, will not go down as far. So it's now flattening out at above 50%. So with just by reviewing whatever it was within the first 18 minutes, I'm now on this forgetfulness curve. And if I, at some point later that day, review those notes one last time. I'm now on this curve, and rather than down the line um, having, you know, about 30% of that information left, down the line with doing no other work, I'm above 70%, just because I reviewed it really quickly at the end and then a little bit more later on. So how does this relate to um, nature journaling and the activities that we're, we're, we're doing? Well, if I, if I'm putting in some of this meta stuff with my journal page, that is reviewing the stuff within the first 18 minutes. And bam, I'm now at a higher rung on the forgetfulness curve. And if later on um, we, we go back and we review those notes um, um, at the end of the week, the stuff which we had done in nature journaling for that previous week, the amount that I'm able to learn from my own direct observation and experiences goes way up. So I can build that the, this journal is my defense against the forgetfulness curve. So that, that's, that's really fun, really, really powerful. Let's take a look at some examples of things that you can do with your own students um, in a COVID environment. So um, some people may be saying like, well, you know, this is, this is great 
if you're you know able to this these journaling things are, are great if you're you know out in the 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 the, the the by the marsh and you go to the marsh you can find all these different these cool birds and things and and owls well that's that's great if you go to the mountains and the lakes all right but what if you are in a more kind of resource limited environment what if instead of being um in the the sierra buttes um or in point Reyes, what if you are on a classroom on a on a school campus with really not a lot of resources. So I, um, I uh, taught nature journaling at uh, Fiesta Gardens uh, International School. Um, it's a, a public Spanish immersion school in San Mateo. And the resources on the school campus are very, 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 very slim. Um, there is, there's a, a few trees in a central courtyard. There is a ball field, and there also is a, a school garden that has been completely neglected and is now filled with oxalis or sour grass and stinging nettle. And so um, this was, um, done with a, a, a group of, of second graders where we went out and we studied the, the, the oxalis. So we were looking at these little uh, sour grass plants and, and, and observing those. Um, those trees in the central courtyard they started to turn color and, and, and change. And so what we did is we went out and we studied those leaves. So we did nature journaling about the leaves. Um, later on, I'm gonna go for, um, um, after the, the, the fall had fallen, and, and spring came when those trees came into bud and flower, we journaled and explored those. So this is just taking care of the advantage of like whatever the resources were that were around us, we used those as our, as our, as our teaching environment. And the, um, we're able to do some really, really cool stuff. Springtime came and we had this wonderful crop of stinging nettle. We studied the stinging nettle and I got zapped by it and all the students recorded the swelling rash on my skin over time. Um, but, you know, this isn't, this isn't a, so th this, this is doing journaling in a, really resource limited environment. Here are the trees in the central courtyard. This is a looking down on it map. And this is a side view diagram of that same view. So do you see how these two things go together? So what we one thing I did is just mapped the locations of these trees with the kids. And we looked at if you're looking at it from the top, how, what are the positions of those trees? And if you, how does that look if you're looking at the side? At the side? And so first off, the students are kind of getting this idea in their heads of the idea of plan and elevation and how those things relate to each other. And then what we did is there are two different types of trees. There are these green ones and there were the, 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 the ones with the, these, these ones with purple leaves and the ones with purple leaves had little pink flowers. And so what we discovered is that the, the flowers were blooming from the bottom of the tree up. And we used these maps that we'd made to show 
how much of these trees were in bloom. So this tree here was all in bloom. You see these ones were half bloomed. So the flowers were on the bottom, the flowers weren't on the top. This one at the top up here was also all in bloom. This one was just blooming at the bottom. And so the students were learning like, oh, we are, we're learning how to document information about what we see and how to show that visually and with words, learning how to make a map, learning how to make a key. All of these are visual strategies that those kids were learning. And then we came about a week later. Oh, there it is. Look at the changes. Look at these changes. So I'm just gonna flip back and forth. So remember these three trees? These ones are just sort of pink on the bottom. All right, that is these three trees here. This one, little, there's one more that didn't get into our little drawing. But these three trees, they're now pink all the way to the top. And the purple leaves are now coming in on the bottoms following those flowers. Look at these ones. So the little um, hatch line there is, these ones now have these purple leaves coming in and that's that hatched part in here. And you're thinking, well, well that's really, really interesting. But my students, probably with this, this might be a little bit too advanced for them. Well, I would, I would challenge that because this activity was done with second graders. And they were able to see and document all those changes in the trees. And then they had this, their, their diagrams to come back later and be able to see how those changes. And they came up with their own questions about what was going on there. And they have, first of all, this, the level of engagement in these students was extremely high. The students were reporting like, I love, they called this science, they, they, this was their science. And they said, I love science. When I grew up, much of the kids were telling me, when I grew up, I wanna be a scientist. I wanna be a scientist, I'm gonna have a journal, I'm gonna do science. Because this was all stuff that they could do from their own observations. And they're learning really valuable science visualization skills as they do this. So that is just a, a, a quick look at phenomena that don't require going to Yosemite, phenomena that don't require that you have to have access to a really fancy park or something like that, but um, are, are just... Um, the common everyday things that are around you. I'm gonna show you one last example of this. And that I think is in this journal. Yeah. Um, the last thing that I wanna show you is, um, let's say you are you know, pre-COVID, um, My, I was out kind of running around and having all sorts of adventures outdoors and you kind of look and there's a lot of kind of big naturey places. Lots of journal notes about that. When COVID runs in, rolls around, my experience changes pretty dramatically. And I want to show you just a little bit of COVID nature journaling, just so you can sort of see that the phenomena can all be things that are really accessible to you, right? These are some wildflowers, poppies, that were in front of my neighbor's house. And they were being eaten by caterpillars. And this is just some studies of caterpillars being munched, or poppies being munched by caterpillars. Zoom in on that a little bit. Um, this, is the bean from Costco, All right? So this was a green bean. I went on a safari in my refrigerator and studied and learned things about the bean, sort of looking at its structure and coming up with my questions about that. 
This is the onion that despite, decided to sprout in my pantry. And this thing has all these cool sprouts coming out. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing, I'm writing about, I'm asking questions. I am, um, I'm measuring things. All of those I can do on the phenomenon that is waiting inside my refrigerator. And as time goes on, I can follow, um, I can follow those phenomenon and see how those things change. So here we have um, measurements of two different parts of this. And then I graph that over time. I'm looking at growth of different portions of this thing. As this thing gets longer, was most of the growth happening in here or was it happening up here? The answer may surprise you. This is the moldy orange. I put, found a moldy orange, put it in a jar, and then tracked that over time. Doing the same thing with an iris, but I just want to jump to the, uh, the oranges here. Yeah, so watching how this thing kind of turns to a fuzzball and then to goo. All of those are phenomena that are just waiting for me in the refrigerator. So nature journaling doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be um, going to some exotic wild spot. It can be just stuff that is, is around us all the time. Jack, um, there was a, since you're moving back and forth in, in the technology, there was a question about the technology that you set up. Is that, is this a good time to talk about that? This is that? a perfect time to do that. Um, and actually, so, your, your audio is breaking up, so I'm not sure if the microphone is maybe sitting on something or something's rubbing it. I think your um, microphone is on the document camera. Uh, that microphone is on the document camera right now. Am I, can we clearly heard right now? No, you're crackling. Is it leaning up against something? Uh, no. Um, I'm going to switch to... Switch oh, your audio. oh, it is. I'm going to switch to this other... To a different microphone. Awesome. Right, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Um, so the, I, I want to just sort of walk you through the technology that um, I use for doing my classes and for sharing stuff online. Um, right now, I'm looking at you through the camera that is built into my computer. And um, if, and your students may have uh, computers or laptops and things, they probably are not looking at things with, uh, don't have access to document cameras. And when people, when people hold something up to the screen, these can work pretty well. Um, a good strategy is to have them take the book, if they're kind of out here and doing this, it's distracting and hard to see. So you can get people to put their elbows down and brace their elbows. And then you get a better look at, at whatever is being held up to the screen. I use a document camera. The kind of document camera that I have is an IPEVO, IVPO, and the brand is a VZR. And this attaches into my computer just by a little USB. There's no external power that is necessary. I just plug that in, and then directly in Zoom, I can switch on the fly um, between this and my um, and and this. All right. So there's our kind of inception moment. All right. So, wow, look how far down that well you can see. Um, so uh, this camera is 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 useful 
Um, it's great for, for doing uh, demonstrations. It's great for, you can show books on it. You can um, uh, also uh, draw and have people be able to see what you're doing. I'm gonna switch back so you don't have to look at my ear. Um, so those are my, my, my primary ways of, of doing things. Another thing that uh, I, I have is I have a drawing tablet. And if I turn on um, Photoshop, I can draw on that drawing tablet and project that to the screen as well. So between those three um, things, those are my, my, my general kind of go-to, um, my go-to approach on, on, on sharing things in a, an online format. What I recommend for teaching uh, nature journaling online is to have a session with the students where you're going to show them the skills, be, give them some examples, give your demonstration, then end the meeting and have them go out and do, without you being on the line, go out and do their nature journaling around the project that you've just described. And then to come back at a predetermined time, everybody sits back, logs back in, and you can have a discussion looking at the student's work, reviewing uh, things that they've seen and done with them, and that that is a, uh, that's a, a, a very effective way of, of handling the nature journaling. Um, trying to be live with people in the field following with, with a phone and here I am sketching and trying to respond, it, it, it's gonna get really confusing. Um, and also, a lot of students are not going to have a, the capacity to bring their computer outdoors with them to have, to sort of do live stuff in the field. So I would recommend sort of setting up your activities, um, find out if there are any questions, send people out to do a little nature journaling project, and then to come on back and have, uh, do some uh, sharing um, online. Did that address those questions? Okay. Yes, I, I believe so. Thank you. Okay, great. The uh, final thing I wanted to kind of uh, also explore here is the idea of, of just to take a closer look at the next generation science standards and how they relate to the act of nature journaling. The, the history behind these science standards is interesting. There have been a lot of different science standards that the, the, the different states have used. And, but what scientists and people at universities found is that people who got really, really good grades in science, we'd get them to the university level when we're, where we're trying, trying now to train them as a scientist. And we would get them in front of ex, um, you know, experimental materials and these sorts of things, the people were completely incapable of doing science. So people who would score really well on, on tests were actually not able as well uh, uh, suited to do science. People didn't know that you could have an experiment bubbling in front of somebody and people didn't know how to even basically observe it and take those ob observations and put them down um, on, uh, on, a, on a piece of paper. And the reason is that our science standards had been a bunch of facts and your job is to memorize those and spit them back on a test. And if you do that, you pass science. So a lot of kids then looked at science as like a bunch of this, all the stuff that is in the book. So what is science? Science is memorizing stuff. It's memorizing terms and, and, and anatomy of things. And, and if you get those, then you're, you do well in science. But that's not the way that scientists think about it. So what happened is the National Academy of Sciences, National um, Academy of Medicine and Institute for Engineering, those folks got together and they said they, they spent years kind of uh, throwing around the ideas of 
if, you know, what should science education look like so that at the end of the day, we would get people who were fluent in science, could talk about science in a way that actually made sense and could do science. And they then sat down with teachers and together over years, they tried, they tried to develop a, a, a set of standards for teaching science that would be, that, that would look, that would kind of train people in the skills that we really wanted at the end of the day, those scientists to have. And instead of being a big bunch of facts to memorize, they came up with um, this. One moment. Um, there we go. Um, am I sharing? There we go. Oh, no, not you. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, let me see. I will try this one more time. Um, we came up with Um, I am sharing the wrong things. We'll try this one more time. Um, share a screen. Ah. Um, Melinda, what screen are you seeing? I'm seeing your title page it's, that has the, the daffodils and the graphic with nature journaling. Ah, that is what I wanted to show, <laughs> um, but I'm not seeing that on my end. Um, we're, we're seeing your view of it, so it's not playing the slideshow yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so where do we see the slide? Well, um, some, a few. Would you like to address some of the questions that we have here? Um, sure. Why don't um, I, I will, um, uh, while I'm kind of uh, clearing a few things in the background here, um, yes, uh, what are a few questions that have popped up? Okay. And, so uh, Deb is asking, is there a brain advantage to either a little each day versus longer, more detailed sessions once in a while? Oh, um, yes. Um, so the, that's a, a really great question. Um, the, the, the little each day is far and away the best way to learn. Um, you get, if you, because what that also allows you to do is to learn something and then reinforce it and build on that. Learn something, reinforce it and build on that. And it also helps develop the routines that are going to make this um, something that you do naturally on your own. If, if students are, um, oh, here we go. Um, so if, if students are just exposed to this in, in big chunks and it has to be an event to do nature journaling, then you're probably not going to just grab your journal when the hawk lands on the balcony. Um, if, but just doing a little bit here and there and here and there and here and there, it normalizes the activity of keeping your, of just downloading your thoughts and your ideas to paper. And that's one, another big advantage of just doing this um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, so here's where we were last time. Um, the, what I wanted to, to, to talk about is the what they call in the next generation science standards um there are these there are they've taken science and they've broken it up into three different pieces and the first part of this they came up with an, a list of things that scientists do in the course of their day kind of actually doing science so these are um 
science not as a bunch of stuff that you've memorized, but these are activities. Um, so you can ask questions. You can develop models to explain things. Um, you can carry out and plan your investigations. All of these different things, making arguments from looking at evidence and sort of making your explanations and arguments based on that evidence. And then how do you figure out if information is good or not? So this, these are the skills of a scientist. And so I can think, you can think about, they call it the science and engineering practices. You can think about this as what do scientists do? The next piece of it is how do scientists think? And what these are, are big picture ideas that once you're exposed to them one time, you're going to see the same idea just surface again and again and again and again. And you, you really get a lot of, it of an advantage by seeing how this one idea ties together a whole bunch of different areas of science. And the third piece of it is essentially those facts, this all the stuff in the science books that we're memorizing before that used to be 99.999% of what we had to do. There still are some bits of science information that are useful and constructive for us to learn, right? So that hasn't entirely gone away, but instead of being all, almost all of everything we do, it is now only a third. And they call those the disciplinary core ideas. So they've got the science and engineering practices. That is um, what do scientists do? The cross-cutting concepts is how do scientists think? And the disciplinary core ideas are what have scientists learned using this system? Um, but each one of these now has equal weight. Let's start over with those science and engineering practices and just take a look at that list and see how many of these things are things that you could do while nature journaling. Um, I would argue that everything on this list, you are going to, um, you're going to be, you can engage in, in a regular practice of nature journaling. So we're using words, we're using pictures, we're using numbers. We have, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. Um, part of, uh, on our next workshop, we're gonna be really unpacking, I wonder, and kind of getting into the details of how can you kind of pull apart a question and sort of figure out how much of that you can actually answer um, by your own observations and, and, and inference. Um, but all of that happens in, um, the, in a nature journal. So that full third of this three-legged stool that is the next generation science standards is, is solidly nature journaling. And then those, those, those cross-cutting concepts are, are, are interesting. So these are the big picture ideas. We f I find that a number of these are much easier to relate to and to relate to in a nature journaling context. So for instance, um, structure and function, patterns, cause and effect, these are things that you are facing all the time as you're looking around the, national, the natural world. Um, things of scale and proportion or systems and system modelings, you, ha you have to be a little bit more intentionally intentional to kind of start uh, geeking out with those things. But um, the way that I, I do this is as I'm teaching nature journaling, I'm teaching those, dis those science and engineering practices in a really solid, rigorous way. When we have our discussions, I'll take one of the cross-cutting concepts, and what I will do is I'll sort of think like, you know, you know, we really haven't danced with the idea of stability and change for a while. And so I'll, I'll, I'll weave kind of questions about um, change through time and those sorts of things. And, and you know, what was it like before? What will it be next with the students? 
and we'll just sort of play with that in our discussion. And we end up having a really interesting discussion around whatever nature journaling activity that we were, we were doing. Um, so I, will, I find it's, uh, that, that pulling the co cross-cutting concepts into the discussion portion of these is a very effective way to do that. I found one other really interesting way of engaging with the, um, the cross-cutting concepts. If I want, say, students to come up with a lot of questions that will relate to patterns, what I will have them do at the start of uh, our nature journaling session is I'll have them write the word pattern or patterns in block or bubble letters somewhere on their journal page. And if they want to, they can decorate that with patterns. So you kind of are making a picture word. Um, so take the word pattern, sort of play with it, make a really cool title out of patterns. If you want to put patterns into the pattern, then you go right ahead. So they'll have some fun doing that. And then what I'll do is I will have them go out and do a nature journaling activity that um, where let's say they're doing a comparison and as and I will explain to them that you know we're also going to as questions come up to you kind of write those questions down and sure enough it turns out that if you have everybody write down the word patterns with patterns you have seeded the idea of patterns in people's head and people will be looking for patterns and they'll have a lot of questions about patterns and then when you kind of get to your group discussions one of my favorite questions to ask the students is like what are some of the most interesting questions that you came up with is these students are now asking questions about patterns and so they're they're coming up with their their own questions this is this is great um, for the disciplinary core ideas um, these um, are sort of specified what you're going to be doing at different grade levels and um, I, I, I think that if people sat down with this whole system and did it another time, they would probably come up with a lot of exactly the same science and engineering practices, a bunch of exactly the same ideas for cross-cutting concepts. And probably when they're getting around to saying like, well, let's teach this in this grade and let's teach this in this grade, there would probably be a lot of shuffling and different things kind of happening in there. So um, I don't really get bent around the axle about like it's third grade. I've got to teach this disciplinary core idea because I know if I'm doing a nature journaling activity, I'm solidly hitting, I'm automatically hitting two thirds of these next generation um, science standards expectations. And, um, and the idea that like, oh, you know, you, in, in this grade, that's when you're going to be talking about the life cycle. Um, I, I usually don't track that. If you're an individual teacher teaching a specific grade, then you want to look into those sorts of things. Um, but you can just automatically get science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts really solidly going. Um, without even referring to this, the, the, uh, you know, the, the big book of standards. Because in all grade levels, they want you doing and exploring all of these different things. Jack, yes. that was lovely. Um, I hate to interrupt, but we are down to the last minute. And you've answered a ton of questions. Some people are really excited about NGSS, but um, I just want to let you know it's eight. It's just eight thirty um, Pacific, and it's pretty late for some folks that are on the East Coast. So, I just thought I'd just pass it back um, to you to let you know what time it is. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, something that really kind of helps if, if I have handlers who kind of can get the hook at the, the at the right time. Um, I'm just gonna just wrap up this idea. And saying, so the reason that um, if you're a homeschool parent, you're saying, look, we're, we're not beholden to some next generation science standards. Why should I care about this? I think this is actually really useful, really, really good stuff. So these lists of kind of science activities, these actually are things that we want our kids to be able to do. This is really functional stuff. This came from like the top scientists sitting around like, like what are the science skills that we really want people to have to be able to be functional with this? How do we, and being able to kind of see the way that some of these cross cutting concepts kind of weave in and out of all sorts of different fields, that is really, really useful. 
you don't have to get bent around the axle about like in fourth grade I should be teaching this um, this disciplinary core idea but for for you folks especially paying attention to those science and engineering practices and those cross-cutting concepts um, this is a useful strategy for improving the way which we think and and interact with um, with doing science. So again, science is a three-legged stool, but what scientists do, how they think, and what they've learned. And in the past, all the emphasis has been on what they learn. And this is just um, resetting it to say that not like these other things that you're actually doing, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's how I find the next generation science standards to be really, really useful. Um, and I encourage you to explore that and, uh, and to, to, to embrace it. Take a look at that list. Those are things that we want to be able to do, and you can.